We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we always do and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for gathering us in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those that are watching live or those that will watch this later, we all ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a series that is beneficial for our iman and our akhirah, something that will have islah, that will have a correctness for ourselves, to purify and cleanse ourselves. This is going to be a da'wah training. But I want people to understand uh, the maqasid or the goals that we want to reach. Okay? If you think you're going to come here to become a YouTube star or a TikTok star, walk out now. This is not going to train you how to be a YouTuber or a TikTok star. You can turn the video off. That, that's not what we're here for. We hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost, that these three days that inshallah we're going to be spending on uh, learning will be a cleansing and purification for ourselves and to better ourselves and then past that inshallah to give us some tools some rules some regulations some motivation some abilities to be able to convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the message of Islam, the message of Tawheed, the message of the oneness of the Creator to the creation. Ah. Da'wah is not done for people to be able to make a lot of money or to be able to uh, become famous or to be able to uh, capitalize on shock factor or things like this. Da'wah is done so people can be connected to their creator. Anybody who does that, just because they want to become famous, they might become famous. Anybody who goes out there and just does things to be able to uh, catch that shock value, will catch the shock value, but they will not get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained upon us, a da'wah that it has been ordained upon us as an ibadah, as a worship. And every ibadah, every worship that is done should be done with two characteristics. There are two things that must be in a worship to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first is ikhlas, it's sincerity. He's not just going to come here and we're just going to talk about Bible verses and how to debate now. The first thing is ikhlas. Everybody who steps out to call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should check their niyyah. If you feel your niyyah is not correct, it does not mean that you don't do it. It means that you correct your niyyah, your intention, and you continuously work on making sure that your sincerity is there, and then you continue with the doubt. Because one trick of shaitan is for you to be ruined with your intention. Meaning he will make your intention, I want to get on TikTok, I want to get on YouTube, I want to get on this, and then I want my video to go viral, and I want that you not get a billion, million views or whatever. This is a trick of shaitan. But the other trick of shaitan is that you say, well, you know, I, I don't know about my sincerity, so I'm just not going to do it. That's also a trick of shaitan. And that's why you have to balance. Always make your intention sincerely for Allah. And at the same time, don't give up. Keep working and keep working on your intention. As Sufyan, one of the great scholars of the earlier times, he said, the hardest thing for me to deal with is the intention in so switching. Okay? It's not just like one time you're going to check your knee and that's it. You're going to walk in and the rest of the time. No. It's going to be continuous. Second condition. For any ibadah to be accepted and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ittiba, the obedience to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is a very important point. How do we give da'wah? And inshallah we're going to talk about details and how to give da'wah, we'll have question answer, we'll have examples, but I want to lay down some foundation. And that foundation is we give the da'wah in accordance to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now what is the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? People get this confused. 
because of the lack of knowledge, sometimes we don't understand the difference between ibadat and adat. Those things that have to do with worship and those things that have to do with cultural norms. Nuh right? he used to call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every which way he could. Openly, secretly, uh, privately, in big gatherings, any which way. Meaning he utilized every method he could of that. Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to utilize every way of that. Meaning in Muslim al Hajj, when the people would gather for Hajj, Mushrikeen, he would go tent by tent speaking to people. But at other times, he would gather people. For example, in the famous hadith, when he got on the mountain in the early times when the Quran was revealed to the Prophet and the da'wah was ordained, and he said, sabah, sabah, and he told them with a warning sign that used to be utilized by the Quraysh to gather them, to warn them about an army. And what they used to do, the Quraysh, in the time of Jahaliyyah, in the time of ignorance, if there was an army about to attack Mecca, they would have this warning sign, this alarm system. And what was the alarm system? Somebody would go up on a particular mountain, and they would, or a hill, and they would take off all their clothes. And then they would say this, Ya Sabah, yani, the people are coming to attack in the morning, meaning uh, right, uh, they're upon us. And this would alert the people to gather their arms and be ready. Now here, this is a method developed by Kuffar, the Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ utilized it to gather the people, but he did not take off his clothes. Why? Because that's against the Sharia. So he utilized the method, but did not violate the rules that Allah has set in the Sharia. And when the people came, he told them, but if I told you there's an army, would you believe me? They said, yes, of course, you're the most honest, you're the trustworthy. Then he, he gave them the da'wah. Now, what is the principle for us that the Prophet ﷺ utilized every venue that he could without violating the Sharia. So if you want to use Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, I don't know, whatever else uh, platform is out there, no problem with that. Utilize it. But do not violate the rules of Sharia. It does not mean that for da'wah, you're going to now uh, shave your beard. Because why? Because I want to look pleasurable for the people. Ah. It does not mean that you're going to throw haram uh, music and things into your videos because it's okay for da'wah. It does not mean you're going to have mixing uh, with, with women and men and things like this to the best of your ability. Like Rasul he used to give da'wah in the streets of Mecca to women as well. But it does not mean that he took Khadija anha and took her to, uh, to mix with men and so on. No. Right? So now, what does that teach us? That every method, because many people tell us, why do you use YouTube? Why do you use Facebook? Why do you use Twitter? Why do you use Snapchat? Why do you use Telegram or Instagram? I, I, I don't know if I use them personally. Right? But, right? Because Kuffar came up with this. Ah, these are methods. Utilize them. Right? But, we're not going to make a dance video on TikTok to give that one. I mean, this is where we draw the line. We're not going to violate the hijab of our sisters to give da'wah. We're not going to uh, violate the ahkam of sharia to give da'wah. No, that is not the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That is the first thing. Secondly, the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is to give da'wah to kuffar. I mean, this is da'wah. I'm surprised that I have to explain this, but I have to explain this. <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he had the Muslims that became Muslim around him, like in the beginning of time, of even in Mecca, Abu Bakr, and through Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Uthman, and uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, earlier than them, and so on and so on, the Sahaba that became Muslim, and then eventually Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, and Hamza radiallahu anhu, and other. It doesn't mean that he just said, okay, these are the Muslims, we need to work on you first, and we don't want to work on anybody else, we're just going to sit around and that will come and just teach you, and that's it. No! He continued to teach them, do a tarbiyah, do a training, do a, 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 a bringing up in iman, in faith, in yaqeen, in, in, his, in their belief, in their reliance upon Allah. He worked on them, but he also continued to call the mushrikeen of Quraysh towards Islam. 
So the da'wah in the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to give da'wah to the non-Muslims. But at the same time, no doubt, we have to have programs to work on our ummah as well. It doesn't mean that you just worry about non-Muslims and you have nothing for the Muslims. No. We have to have the rules, we have to have halaqat, we have to have uh, gatherings of knowledge, we have to have programs for Muslims to, to protect our children and our future generations and to support the, the brothers who become Muslim and sisters who become Muslim and to help them learn knowledge and so on. And at the same time, we have to continue to call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the non-Muslims. This is a balance. This is how we see in the example of the earlier prophet like Musa He was working on Ben Israel, but he also had to go to Fir'aun. And that's why Musa as many of the ulama of tafsir have mentioned of explanation in the Quran, that he is the most mentioned prophet in the Quran. Why? Because he had such a job that our ummah would have such a job. He would work on the ummah, but he would also go out to the kuffar and to call them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you. I want to get into some of the ayat and ahadith regarding that. Today's introduction is going to be first and foremost based on uh, giving you some of the virtues and usul and principles. Fadabin ul usul al da'a. Inshallah, tomorrow we will get into a lot of the actual techniques of how to deal with the Bible and so on. And then, inshallah, the last day, Saturday, we'll also get into a lot of the common criticisms and questions and answers. And every day we'll have questions and answers, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in Surah Nahl, he orders the Prophet The first thing to understand from this ayah, as Tabari and others have mentioned, is that this is fil'am. This is an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet And then, as we will see in the, in the later ayah, the order is not just for the Prophet it's for everybody who follows the Prophet But what does it mean, Sabiri Rabbika? Here, we do not give the Qur'an our own explanations. We do not give our own explanations. We always go back to the Salaf of this Ummah, to the earlier generation, the Sahaba, the Tabi'un, those great scholars, like Ismail al-Suddi, who somebody who died in 127 Hijri. Yeah, he is very, very early on, as uh, a Ba'labi, in his tafsir is also mentioned, in Ibn Kathir and others, uh, he was a Tabi'i. He is from those who were students of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, and he explained this, he said, Ila Rabbika, yani, towards your Rabb, what does it mean that you give da'wah towards the Tawheed? Just as the Muqatil, Muqatil also very early Mufassir of the Quran, he said, well, Islam, yani, this is to call towards Islam. Bil Hikmah, in the ayah then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bil Hikmah, with wisdom. Now, Ibn Kathir here, he says that no doubt that there is a wisdom in how you call towards. But when we go to the earlier scholars, uh, as Muqatil and others, they mentioned, they said, Bil Hikmah, yani Bil Quran, with the Quran. In explanation of that, uh, Shaykh Muhammad Amin Shaqiqi and others, they mentioned, Bil Quran, Bil Wahi. Yani the Quran and the Wahi, which includes the Hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Very important principle. Yeah, you will notice I'm going from the Quran and from the Ahadullah. This is not my own opinion. Okay? Some people think that one is just my creative ideas. We have all these, mashallah, I'm not mentioning anybody's name. They come up with their ideas of some kind of new way of da'wah. I got this new method of da'wah. In two minutes, we can do shahada. In three minutes, I can do this. In four minutes, I can do this. Look, our da'wah is not towards you, or towards me, or towards my aql, or my intelligence, or your intelligence. Our da'wah is towards the Qur'an and what is established from the Prophet That is the meaning of the hikmah. Is the wisdom is to go back to the evidences. Not that you came up with some new way. <laughs> right? What is the wisdom? We do not violate the rules of the Sharia. That is the hikmah. 
وموعد في الحسنة وجادلهم بالذي هو أحسن. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues in a يعني invite towards your own wisdom and a kind advice. If the Kathir here, he explains this. He says that with the best akhlaq. And when we give da'wah, we keep the best akhlaq. And with kindness, lean, and softness, gentleness, good words. Ibn Kathir makes a great mufassir of the Quran. Ibn Kathir makes a great point in his tafsir. He says, this is like what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Fir'aun to be, how he ordered Fir'aun to be talked. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam that go and talk to Fir'aun with qawla, يعني, a, a statement that is lean. Lean, يعني, soft. يعني, think about this. Many people ask me, how is it that when you give da'wah, you see some Islamophobes like Sam or David or any of those guys, you know, how can you be soft with them? How can you shake hands with them? How can you speak to them? Uh, and, he, and these guys do this with the Quran, they say this. Look, he is not worse than Fir'aun. And I am not better than Musa by any means. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Musa السلام, to be soft in his approach and his da'wah to Fir'aun, then how can we have bad akhlaq? Today we see some of the du'at using foul language, using curse words. Yani, some words like dumb or idiot, like I'm not talking about that, but words that are indecent words in their da'wah. And they think this is going to grab attention and they're going to use it. Yeah, but this is not the way of the Amiya. This is not the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained. Sometimes you have to be harsh in da'wah. Meaning you're not always going to be soft. The Rasulullah that sometimes he was firm, but he was never indecent. Sometimes you have to be clear when you talk about the uh, wisdoms behind hijab and things. Sometimes the examples you will give will have to be يعني, uh, explicit in a way. And nothing wrong with that. And we see from the ahadith of Rasulullah when he explained certain things يعني, about the ahkam or tahara and stuff, he had to mention certain things. But at the same time, he was never fahash, he was never lewd with his speech. And this is what Ibn Kathir he mentions here that if Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam, two prophets, were told to be gentle in their speech to Fir'aun, then what greater tawhi and what greater oppressor do we face today in da'wah than Fir'aun? So, this is a, a very important hikmah in da'wah and the usul in da'wah. And to يعني, debate with them, jadilhum, is a dalil that you should convey the message even if it gets to a debate. Thank you. I want to lay down some foundations here as well. We are not debaters. Some people get confused. I make this statement and, and some of the Islamophobes get confused. Even though it's very simple. I'm going to simplify it again for them. They get into rain and dry and rain on or something. Right? We are not debaters. That is not what we go out to do. Right? But if somebody comes and wants to debate and they make that a barrier to that one, we will debate with them. Thank you? Let me give you another example to make this clear. I don't go out to fight. Okay? We go out to give da'wah, we call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if somebody attacks me, you better believe I'm not turning the other cheek. I'm going to defend myself. Right? I'm going to push somebody back to where they cannot harm me. Why? Because that is what is correct. That is what our religion teaches us. That is what fitra, the natural state teaches us. Right? So if I tell somebody, look, if you attack me, I'll knock you out. And they say, well, you said you're not out there to fight. I'm not. But if you attack me, you better believe I'm not running. Right? So, this is the balance. We don't, I don't, personally, I don't set up debate stages and all this kind of stuff. I don't go out there with intention. I go out there to give the help. But if somebody wants to, and they come up to us, 
and make a, a hindrance for da'wah, we will debate them until, alhamdulillah, Allah makes the amr uh, wadi, I mean, the, the issue clear for everybody. And here, the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, our principle is, we don't waste time in useless debates. We don't debate about things that are not relevant. We don't debate about things that are uh, hypothetical. And that is true. But some people confuse that with not debating to clarify the haqq upon the proof, which is something that Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, and other great ma did. So understand the difference. Some people, they have debates, like they will debate with uh, somebody about what was the color of the dog of Sahab al-Kahar. What benefit is there? There's no benefit in it. Don't debate about it. They will make up debates about hypothetical situations having to do with uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and things. We don't waste our time with these things. Right? But if somebody comes and tells us Allah is three, and we tell them Allah is one, and we say, oh, you're debating with them. No, that's not a debate. We're establishing the hujjah upon them. And that is something that we find from the great ummah, from the salaf of this ummah. Nothing wrong with that. Tayyip. When we talk about da'wah, we want to understand what you are calling towards. Right? When we talk about in the earlier ayah, what Sabir Rabbika. But we see also in Surah Al Ma'idah, in the 67th ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the Prophet Ya Ayyur Rasul. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Mukhatib. He's speaking to the Prophet Balligh. Balligh. This is again an order given. And this is not something that if you want to do, it's okay, you'll get more reward. No, these are orders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا أُنْتِرَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ What do you call to words? مَا أُنْتِرَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ What has been revealed to you from your Rabb? And that is again a very important point in the Qur'an itself that we call to words the Qur'an and what is Sahih from the Mustafa alayhi salatu salam because that's why. That is what we call to words. People today want to make up their own religion. Right? People want to make up their own hudud, their own ahkam, their own... Na'ani, if the sharia tells you that the hand of the thief is cut, the hand of the thief is cut. Oh, you guys, in William Kampel, you'll get that. Right? That is the sharia. We believe in it. We call to words it. And we explain the benefits of society, we explain the wisdom, we explain the, the, the checks and balances of the sharia, we explain the, the legal system, we explain all of that. But we don't change that to what we feel. Oh no, no, that was for a different time. Nowadays we don't do that. <laughs> Recently we had some women come and ask about polygamy. And, and many people Nowadays, when you see, uh, I don't watch people's videos, to be honest with you, other than scholars and stuff to benefit from, but many people send me clips of people, even after I give my answer, some people send me clips of du'a that said, oh, no, no, that is not, not applicable anymore, not in this country, not in that. Allah. Who gave you the authority to change the Sharia? Who gave you the authority to change the Quran and the Sunnah? No. We are du'at. We are callers. We are not uh, yani people who make up ahkam. We don't make up our own rulings. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains something, it is the best. It is excellent. It is the, how can something be better than what Allah has ordained? Okay? So what do we call towards? We call towards that. We don't change that to fit society. We don't change that. If, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the amal, the action of Qawm al haram, it is haram. I don't care what society it is, I don't care about being cancelled or caught or this or that or whatever else you want to do. That is the idea, then we stick to it, right? Of course, we explain it in a way with hikmah, with wisdom, I mean, with a way that's ahsan, the way that's best. I mean, with, with ways that can, people can understand. But it doesn't mean we explain it away. Okay? Now, understand something. There is a difference between what is revealed in the ahkam of sharia and things that have to do with tarikh and things. Right? For example,
example, and I'm going to discuss the age of Aisha in great detail, inshallah, on the last day. But just to understand, I mean, people talk about the age of Aisha as if Allah SWT ordained in the Quran. Or the Prophet Aisha told us about it. No, I mean, when we have things like this, then of course we say this is what's in the Bukhari, this is what is Muslim, this is what who said, this is what this Qur'an, this Qur'an said. We explain the issue. But things that Allah has ordained in the Qur'an, or things that the Prophet has authentically established as part of the Sharia, then they are what they are. We have to stand on it, we have to defend it, we have to be clear about it, and we have to present it in a way that's wise, but we call towards what is in the Qur'an Muslim. Right? Ibn Kathir, for example, uh, in the tafsir of this ayah, and there's a lot to it, just for the like, sake of uh, our time, I'm just going to give some beneficial points and move forward, inshallah. He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told the Prophet وسلم, that if you don't do this, then you will be held accountable. And if you do this, then Allah will protect you and give you support and aid you against your enemies and make you victorious. Many people, in their da'wah, they sold out the race. Many people, for the sake of any acceptability, they, they changed their appearances and changed what they used to say. They used to say one thing, and then they changed it after going to certain universities or being invited to certain places and things like this. They changed it up. They thought that was going to make their da'wah more acceptable. Alhamdulillah here, with the brothers from the One Message Foundation, May Allah protect us all and everybody moves upon the Qur'an and Sunnah. We kept it to what it was. Alhamdulillah, our da'wah was strong. We have people accepting Islam. We say oh, one weekend, we had six people in one weekend and so on. Alhamdulillah, why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that died. Our job is to convey, Ma'alina illa balagul mu'min. It is not upon us except to clearly uh, convey the message. Then we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Yusuf in the 108th ayah, He orders uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, قُلْ say, هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي This is my way. This is the sabil of the Prophet ﷺ. Ibn Abi Hatim, the great scholar, very early scholar, a scholar of the Jab of Ta'adil as well, he records from Abdul Rahman ibn Zayn ibn Aslam, one of the early, early scholars of Islam, that he says, what is the meaning of sabili? He says, هَذَا أَمْرِ وَالسُنَّةِ وَمِنْ حَاجِ that this is what Rasulullah has been ordered with. This is the Sunnah of the Prophet. This is the way, the manhaj, the methodology of the Prophet is Ad'u in Allah. Is to call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This has been ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet to say this is the way of Rasulullah. But how? Ala basira. How? Ala basira. What is basira? If the Kathiri explains basira, short knowledge. And that is why we tell the du'at, you have to be tullab ilm. You have to be students of knowledge, whatever level you may be at. Doesn't mean you have to be ulama. It does not mean you have to be a scholar to be a da'i. Okay? Not every da'i will be an alim. But every da'i should be a talib of ilm, a student of knowledge. Okay? Meaning, the Rasul ﷺ told us, بَلِّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةٌ Convey upon me, even if it's a single verse. Yes, so if you know that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, tell somebody that. No problem with that. But it doesn't mean that فَقَدَ الْآيَةَ يَكْفِي لَكَ It doesn't mean that that ayah is enough, khalas, don't learn anything else. No, you need to learn, you need to grow in your Islam, in your knowledge. And as you are learning and growing, the more you learn, the more you call towards. When somebody asks you something that you don't know, don't answer it. I mean, if you know the ayah, then talk about it. If you don't, say, La adri wallahu alam. Let me go to the scholars. Let me go to the talab and let me go to others who can give you that answer. So you know your place. And give da'wah. But upon knowledge, if you're going to be a da'i, if you're going to be calling towards Allah, then be a talib ilm, be a student of knowledge. So when you call, you call ala basira, yani upon knowledge. 
Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He continues. Ana, yani this is the Prophet Muhammad being told to say to the Ummah that this is my way. I call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon sure knowledge. Ana, umman ittaba'ni. Me and everybody who makes my ittaba'. Everybody who is a follower of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is their responsibility. Right? Today we think there's going to be a jama'ah. A jama'ah is going to come out and their jama'ah da'wah, and their jama'ah tabliq, and their jama'ah this, and their qamat, and their this, and their that. And they're going to do da'wah, and we're going to sit around, and we're just going to watch the video, and that's we've done our part. No! You have to be involved. This is your responsibility. Uh, Tafsir al-Arabi, he mentioned from Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, the great uh, Sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Muhammad ibn Sahib and others from the Tabi'un and Zabat Tabi'un, others have also made the same tafsir. They said, What does it mean? Ana wa tabani, yani haqqun alim. This is the haq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the people, man tabah, whoever makes a tabah, to call toward what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed, a tafkira, yani the Quran, the tafkira, the reminder, which is the Quran. Imam al Tabari and others, they also have said that the meaning here. Uh, is given from a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Tabrani had mentioned the hadith, Sanadan with the chain, that he created to be Hassan, that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا أَنَا مُبَلِّغُ وَاللَّهِ يَهْدِي Verily, I am one who conveys the message, and Allah is the one who guides. Right? So what does it mean? This is the way of Rasulullah ﷺ, and of everybody who is a follower of the Prophet ﷺ, to call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyip, does that mean everybody, man, woman, child, whoever is uh, responsible for this, will go out on a table and debate and argue? No. This is not what we see from the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. We didn't see Khadija radiallahu anhu, Aisha radiallahu anhu going in the streets and having debates with, with men and things like this. No. But there are going to be those like Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu. He was the poet of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was eloquent in his speech. So when he would go, he would go out and he would call towards Allah subhanahu wa taala uh, in a way that was an, an excellent way of conveying a message. Okay. He was excellent in his speech, so he went out and spoke. Other Sahaba radiallahu anhu, they weren't out there speaking, but they were there supporting in other ways. Some of them that were wealthy, they were supporting with their wealth. Some of them, like we see most of the Sahabiyat, they were the most crucial part of the da'wah because they are the ones that would support the men, they would encourage their men. When their men would stay home from jihad, for example, from qital even, they would tell them, what's wrong with you? How can I have the only husband that stayed back? Go! I mean, this is something we see an encouragement. Khadija radiallahu how she supported the da'wah of the Prophet sallallahu she was 100% involved in. But it doesn't mean that she was out there facing down Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab and things. No. So every Muslim has to be involved in the da'wah, but in different ways. Some of you, you are excellent in technology. Go make clips, make videos, uh, help promote the da'wah. Some of you, Allah has blessed with wealth. Support the da'wah with your wealth. Some of you are good with your words. Come and be those that speak. Some of you have expertise in hadith, in fiqh, in, in Quran, in the Bible, in science. Bring that to the table. Okay? But don't take it where if you don't know about aqidah, you're out there on Instagram and Twitter and talking about aqidah and, and ma'ina and kafi, and you don't know the meanings of the words. Right? You're good at something, use that for that. You're not good at something, go and sit and learn from those until you get better at it. And when you are qualified, then speak about it. This is a responsibility for the entire ummah, but in the places that will be correct for them. Oh, yeah. Tayyid, inshallah, I will be, uh, again, we'll be opening up question and answer. I know people have questions, but uh, until we finish, we'll hold the questions, inshallah. Tayyid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali, uh, Ali Imran, in the 110th ayah, he tells us a, a, a great glad tidings for this woman. We talk about da'wah, we talk about the fadail of it as well as the virtue of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, nas, ta'amuruna bil ma'aruf wa ta'inhawna ala al-munkar wa tu'minuna billah. 
Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, and other Arabi and other people of uh, the great scholars of tafsir, they mentioned a narration from Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu that says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that you are the best of nations sent out for, for the people to, and you were sent out for the people. You invite towards what is good and you forbid from what is evil and you believe in Allah. If somebody wants to be a part of what is in the first part of the ayah, meaning that you are the khair umar, the best of nations, then you have to fulfill the shah, the condition in the second uh, half of the ayah, which is that you invite towards good and you forbid from evil. Right? Today many people, you, ah, I'm so glad I'm from the Ummah of the Prophet we're the best Ummah, we're the first one to enter Jannah, no, 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 mashallah. But are we fulfilling the conditions of being from this Ummah? When we see something and we know that there is something we need to call towards, like when we see shirk, for example, right? What do I mean by shirk? I don't just mean somebody going and worshipping an idol. When we see a Christmas uh, gathering, Right? What do we do? Do we send a greeting, you know, because somehow Sharia has changed, so now we want to congratulate people on ship? No. Nah. And we have to do Amr bin Maruf and Ahlunka. How? You have to evaluate the situation. If you are the head of a household, if you are the head of a country, if you are the leader of a place, if you have authority in that place, then you have to stop ship. Understand. Christmas and Easter have nothing to do with Isa and Nibari, with Jesus. We challenge any Christian, anybody, to bring us a single verse from the Bible that shows that Isa and Nibari, Jesus, the son of Mary, peace be upon him, was born on the 25th of December, or in December, or in the winter. Where did you get Santa Claus? What does Santa Claus have to do with Isa and Nibari? Where did you get reindeer, eggnog? You think they had eggnog in, in, in Quds, in Palestine? You think Isa ibn Maryam was putting gifts under trees? You think uh, some fat guy in a, in a, in a big uh, uh, red jacket, which Coca-Cola made red, by the way, you think he was going down the chimney at people's houses in, in, in Quds? No! Ask any biblical scholar, they will tell you that Jesus, peace be upon him, according to biblical references, according to the, the state of trees and so on, as mentioned, the verses indicate that it was in the summer. Right? So where did you get Christmas? It's a Nordic pagan festival. Things like Halloween and these things. So when we see these things, then if we have the authority, you have to stop. If you do not, then you speak about it in a way that's best. It doesn't just mean that you say, ah, oh, this is haram, this is this. No. Maybe at work, bring up the conversation. Oh, that's interesting. What is Christmas about? Jesus' birth? Oh, that's funny because I got a Bible and I didn't find it. Can you show me? Open up the minds of people. Open up that conversation in a good way. Right? And if you're unable to do that, if you're under some strict communist regime or something, hate it with your heart. But that iman, as the Muslim said, that this is the lowest form of iman. When you see the wrong, and if you don't correct it with your hand and not with your tongue, and not you don't hate the hating of the heart, but if you are looking at Christmas, let's go check out Christmas lights. What? Let me go to my neighbors. Merry Christmas. What? You're congratulating them on what? Happy Halloween. Have we got Hanukkah? Happy Hanukkah yet? But most of them are not there yet. So I'm sure they're there yet. Right? Then you understand that this is a problem. This is where we are not fulfilling the obligation upon this ummah. Don't be then going out and saying, who's, who's everybody like, who's proud to be in the ummah of the Prophet Well, if you're proud of it, then fulfill the responsibility. And understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed this ummah with it. There's a great virtue of this ummah with it. The virtue of this ummah with it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the glad tidings of being the best of nations. The last of them, chronologically, but the first of them to enter Jannah. The one that would be a witness upon the earlier nations. The one that the Anbiya made dua to be a part of this Ummah. The great uh, yani honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And know that when you call somebody towards good, and yani when you are calling people towards Tawheed, there can be nobody whose words will be better than yours. 
you are doing the greatest responsibility as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنْ And who can be better قَوْلًا Whose statements, whose words, whose speech, who... I mean, people today talk about eloquence and this, but whose words can be better than the one who's, who's calling towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, da'il Allah. He's calling towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And he does good deeds. He himself should be doing good deeds. You as a da'i, as a caller towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your words to be calling towards tawheed, there is nothing better than this. As Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu made tafsir of this ayah, as al ghazali mentions, that who is being referenced here? Who are Rasulullah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And everybody who is da' in a shahada, and whoever is calling towards the shahada, and then la ilaha illallah, that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, then every one of them will be included in this ayah, that the best words are those words of theirs, but as it mentioned that they need to themselves do good deeds. If he says that this does mean that you don't just become professional, right? He says you do good deeds. What we have amongst many of the Christians and stuff is just a show now. They get on stage, they get everybody motivated and all of that, and then they're out there drinking and doing whatever. Right? As Muslims, all of us are going to have shortcomings. None of us are perfect. All of us are going to make mistakes. But if we are du'at, we need to continuously work on ourselves and try to increase our good deeds. And try to be on those that practice upon what we know. And everybody will have shortcomings, don't give up. But this is a condition that they do amal salihah They do the good, righteous deeds themselves. And if we fulfill that, then we look at the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he gave him the order to go out and summarize his mind to the wrong of hadith and to call people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides somebody through you, khayra laka, and it is better for you than min yakun laka, and if there is for you, humar al-na'm. Humar al-na'm, yani the flock, not just one, but a flock of the reddish tinted camel, the camel that had a reddish tint, these were the most valuable of things, and this is Sahih al this is better for you that one person is guided through you than you have a whole flock or a whole herd or whatever you have camels for you, right? What does that tell you? Today, whatever we see as valuable, if you see Ferraris, if you see Bentleys or, or buildings or whatever else, yachts, if you have a whole lot of them, or the best of them, but one person is guided through you, it's better for you than all of that wealth. All of that wealth will finish. But the good deeds, and this is explained in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, in the authentic narration from Imam Muslim, that if somebody calls towards something good and the person acts upon it, they will get the reward without taking anything away from the one who did it. So what does that mean? If you go out and you're in Long Beach, for example, and you're out there giving da'wah, and one person comes and listens to you, and from you, Allah guides. From you as the means, Allah guides. Remember, the hadith we mentioned earlier, the guidance is from Allah, right? Allah guides that person. Now, they go home, they, they make the ghusl, they start to make salah, they're making salah, they will get the reward, you will get the reward. Our own actions, Wallahu alam that I accept. Wallah, I don't know if even one sit that I've made in my life is accepted and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't know if any umrah, any hajj, any zakat, any sadaqah that I've done is accepted. We hope from Allah. We don't know. But we know that here, if Allah guides somebody through you, then their deeds are being put in your reward as an accepted reward. What a great business. What a great yani, tijara. What a great uh, yani, uh, means. How can we ignore this? Our sisters, yani, many of you interact with women that we as men don't interact with. I mean, bring up Islam, bring up hijab, bring up tawheed, speak to them. In universities, in workplaces, in schools, when you go for PTA meetings or whatever, bring up these issues with hikmah. You know, people maybe in your own family that's not Muslim or is away from the religion, make it a means of da'wah for them. Our brothers, any which way you are, schools, universities, workplaces, 
Muslims and non-Muslims, whoever is aware that needs that reminder, be a means of that reminder. And if a Muslim, for example, makes tawbah and starts to make salah because of you, you get that reward. If somebody gives zakat because you encourage them, you get that reward. And if a non-Muslim becomes Muslim at your hands, subhanAllah, what is, I mean, everything in the Islam now is going to be in your reward. What amazing, amazing thing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is so merciful that He doesn't take anything away from their reward. So, understanding these uh, virtues and these guidelines, we end our first session. And inshallah, I'll open up for question and answers now with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you. Good question. How do you approach a non-Muslim spouse about Islam without pushing them away? I'm going to kind of mold your question a little bit because I don't want to go into some other. So I'm going to mold it into being it's a Muslim man and the woman is from the Ahlul Kitab. <laughs> because if not, if it's a Muslim woman and a non-Muslim man, or the woman is a, a Hindu or Buddhist or something, then there's a whole different path we have to go under, which would I mean, be different. But here, in this situation, and he obviously, first and foremost, by speaking to them. Like, let's say if a brother becomes Muslim, and his wife is a practicing Jewish woman, uh, alhamdulillah, I mean, that's fine, but now he has to call her towards Tawheed. I mean, this is the first thing. With wisdom, with love, not with I any mean, anger and things like this. Secondly, by showing a great example. Right? Many people that are sitting here, I don't want to point them out, but yani, after their acceptance of Islam, many of their family members were impressed first and foremost by their changing for the better. And yani, people that maybe in their old religion used to get drunk and yani, gamble or whatever else, ills that are still allowed in some of those religions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has made haram those upon us. When we leave those ills, when we have better temperaments, when we have better mannerisms, that is a da'wah in itself. Right? Past that, yani, many people are, and we had this, uh, I think, two weeks ago. We had one brother come, and his wife was a uh, Christian, uh, Christian-ish yani, uh, woman. And subhanAllah, he didn't know how to convey Islam to her. So what he did is he just played the OMF videos for her. And subhanAllah, from that, she agreed to come to San Diego from another city, and she ended up taking the shahad. And before that, we have another brother, uh, the Malaysian brother who brought his Japanese wife, who also became Muslim the same way, and so on. So, another way, you can share with her any videos, books, things about Islam that maybe can explain things better. Right? We have many people who uh, give da'wah to a spouse. We had the African-American sister uh, who came from, I think, Illinois or somewhere in the Midwest. Her husband also, same thing, they flew to San Diego because she saw the video and she agreed. So, if you cannot, maybe you can take her to somebody else, a da'i or a alim or somebody or a talib ilm or an imam of a masjid who maybe can explain it in a better way. Right? All of these ways are there, but what shouldn't be is you give up. Like, ah, okay, whatever, she does her thing, I do mine. No. The household should be based on one methodology. Questions? So, the brother, okay. So, you mentioned like the Dawa is an obligation. Yes. So, how do we know that like we're fulfilling the duty to the best of our abilities? Great question. Giving Dawa, in essence, like actually going and speaking about Islam is fardul kifaya. Yani, as Sheikh Abdul Ibn Abbas has mentioned, that this is a communal obligation. When it's not being fulfilled, Yusuf Sawal uh, If it's not being fulfilled, then it becomes fardul ain. It becomes an individual obligation, as Sheikh Abdul Ibn Abbas and others have said that in these times, this is the way it is. How do you know that you're fulfilling that obligation? Well, we have to first take a step, right? Meaning, everybody should think, what can I do to support the da'wah? 
Somebody may come and say, you know what, what I, I'm not a good speaker, I, I get nervous, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that. So what can I do? I can tell the brothers who are, like the brothers from YMF, for example, tell them, hey, Allah has blessed me, I have some money saved, here's some money. This is what I can do, here's what I can do. And you ask Allah to accept it from you. Somebody else may say, you know, Allah hasn't given me that kind of wealth, but I'm kind of struggling, but alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm very good with uh, video editing. I'm very good with social media and stuff. So I approach the brother and say, hey, you know what, I have this skill, I want to use it for the dawah. Somebody else may come and say, you know what, uh, maybe I'm a woman, I have children, I, can, I, got, I got too much going on. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell my husband, hey, you know what, Sunday, what are you doing home? Go, go to the park. And it's masjid time, go to the masjid. Right? That's what I can do. Everybody needs to figure out what they can do. And then they need to do their part and ask Allah for acceptance. Everybody knows their abilities. And you know how much you can push yourself. Push yourself. Right? Most people, most Muslims, especially in the West, are just lazy. We have time. I mean, people are like, oh, I don't have time for all that. You have time to watch soccer. You have time to watch cricket, but not so much in the West. <laughs> you have time to watch baseball. You have time to watch football. You have time to watch the Marvel series. You have time to watch uh, this uh, TV show. And you have time to go and talk about this useless political blah, blah, all day, this. You have time for all that, but then you don't have time for da'wah. Oh. And you don't have time to uh, learn. Huh? You can make excuses in front of people. You can make excuses to yourself, but you think your excuse will work in front of Allah. So everybody should judge themselves with that. Inshallah, um, brother. In regards to rewards, um, when someone uh, helps revert uh, another uh, person, um, let's say that person, like you were saying, uh, every salah they, uh, they pray, right? Um, and it's accepted, right? So does that person that helped revert them also get the same reward, or is it... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them the full reward. Many of the ulama said, even if the person's deed is not accepted, the one who was a means for their da'wah will get the full reward. Right? Which is something beautiful, because somebody may make salah and get only 10% of the reward. But the one who called them towards the salah will get 100% of the reward. There is difference of opinions among salama, but that is what is rajih from the wording of the hadith. That you will get the full reward. We have a question from the sisters. Um, can we take from the Prophet that the da'wah starts with the Muslims because in some aspects of the Prophet's life, he وسلم, focused on the Sahaba and the Ummah, and in some aspects he emphasized on da'wah to the Mushrikeen. Uh, we cannot take that from the life of the Prophet وسلم, because the life of the Prophet is very explicit. I and mean, when the da'wah began, he went out to the Kuffar. And as the Sahaba became Muslim, no doubt he focused on their tarbiyah, and that's a responsibility that we have. But he never took the focus away from going out and calling towards Islam to the Kuffar. This is not an either or, this is not binary, it's not a one or zero issue. Right? We have to have that off for the Muslims, meaning we have to have tarbiyah, we have to have programs, we have to have outreach, we have to have all those things because we don't want to be like the bucket. That things come in and there's a hole and the water just kind of goes through. That is true. At the same time, we cannot ignore there are people going to Jahannam, people that will die. If you're a person of Tawheed, even if you're sinful, inshallah you will get to Jannah. But if you die on shit, so we cannot ignore either one. Our Ummah has today become such that everybody wants to take one juz and think that is the whole thing. Somebody just wants to make dhikr, and they think making dhikr, and this tariqah, and this this, and this that, is a whole deen. Somebody wants to take qital, and they make it a whole deen. Some people want to take knowledge, and they make it a whole deen. Some people want to take da'wah, they make it a whole deen. That is not the way it works. Our deen is complete. Somebody will be better in qital, somebody will be better in dhikr, somebody will be better in, in uh, zuhud, somebody will be better in ilm, somebody will be better in other aspects, but the deen is whole. So we have to work on all aspects. Each one of us should be seeking knowledge. Some of the brothers here, alhamdulillah, will be involved in teaching and learning. They will not be at the park. Some brothers, they don't have the ability to teach. Maybe they're not there. They will be at the park. Some people will not be at the park. They will be out taking money to the poor and working on that. Alhamdulillah, nothing wrong with that. But we as an ummah should be working on all of that together. 
Because the Prophet ﷺ never ignored any of that. He never left Salah because he was focused on, uh, on Yateen. And today we have an organization reached out to me. They were talking about some charity programs, whatever. And they were like, yeah, you know, we don't, we're not too worried about hijab and salah and those things. We're just worried about taking care of these needy Muslims and things. So no, this is not the way it works. Don't think your wealth is enough. You need the barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to be worried about salah and hijab and, and all of the shari'i ahkam. And then, inshallah, also fulfill our responsibility towards needy Muslims and so on. Thank you. Next question. Uh, how would be the best way for the people that do go on to the park to deal with two things, the shubhat that the Christians get from you know, all the websites and stuff? Like, what would be the best way to say if the person doesn't know how the, the, the response? And the other thing would be with hecklers that try and yell or like, cause a scene or do stuff. So you're, maybe I'm not the best person to answer this, but okay. <laughs> so the second part of the question. Okay. Um, the first response, how do you deal with shubhat? You go to the people of knowledge. Right? If you don't know, tell them, look, let me, I'm, 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 everybody should be out there just to convey a message. Tell them, look, here's the path, that, here's the book, you want to take it. Other than those that, for example, we have told that you, you can engage in debates and things, nobody should be engaged in any debates. But if somebody comes with that, tell them, you know, we're going to ask our, our uh, teachers and so on, we'll get back to you with the answer. Then go to the people of knowledge. There is nothing that these people can bring up that the ulema has not explained. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the whole Qur'an is studied word by word, letter by letter. I mean, ulema of tafsir every year in, in many different lands and different languages explain all of it. There is nothing in the Qur'an or in Sahih Hadith or in Da'if Hadith or in Mawdu Hadith that our ulema have not touched on. And there is nothing of doubt in our religion. That's why many of these preachers and priests, when we hit them with the Bible verse and they've never seen it, it surprises me. Like you've been teaching for 40 years, you've never seen this verse, right? There's nothing in the Quran we have not seen, right? So if they bring something, no problem. And inshallah, on the last day of this training, we'll go over some of those. But if they bring something new, go to the people of knowledge, show it to them, let them give you a response and then take that response to them. That's the first thing. Second thing with hecklers and people who go out there and try to uh, cause problems, uh, yeah, I mean, there's different ways to deal with different people. And we learned this from the Prophet ﷺ. There are people that the Prophet ﷺ grabbed. In a hadith where he grabbed. Right? And there are people that pulled the cross off his body and he let it go. Right? Sometimes you have to be soft. Right? Sometimes somebody comes, and this is a judgment call. And I can't give you like if it's past uh, 2.3 decibels that you can't hide it. Right? Sometimes it would be like, you know, miskeen, let it go. If somebody has uh, any mental challenges and stuff, well, of course we don't waste our time. It's okay. Make God for them. Sometimes you'll have to put them in their place. You have to tell them, no, we're not here to be mom, right? Because some people, this is what they respond to. Right? And some people, yani, you will have to ignore them because it takes away from the bigger uh, devil. But not always. Like sometimes somebody tries to break into a conversation, you have to just ignore it. No. Sometimes they won't let you go on the conversation. Then you have to shut them up and continue your conversation. Those things you'll have to kind of learn with experience and yani, uh, with the hikmah that Allah will give you. Ask Allah, and Allah will give you the hikmah. Sometimes you have to tell people you're not enough. Uh, what to do if a friend you want to turn to Allah always laughs off your advice? and doesn't uh, give a thought at all, what kind of advice would you would be helpful to a person like that? Any, uh, of course, first thing is not to give up. You need to continue to give them advice, continue to... And then make it to a relationship where the religion is not laughed off. Meaning, uh, if, I'll give you an example, right? Let's say you have a very good friend and uh, they come home and they're like, uh, did you get my results from the doctor? And you're like, yeah, you got cancer. And they're like, no, I got cancer. I'm like, no, 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 I'm serious, you got cancer. You got to get you therapy and this, and you got to get your doctor. And they're like, ah. <laughs> right? You're not going to let them laugh it off. You're like, no, you're about to die. I got to take you to a doctor. I'm, like, no, I'm serious, right? Like, this is not a laughing matter. Nobody laughs that off, right? If your house is on fire, 
and the fire is coming more and more, and then your friend is sleeping, are you going to be like, uh, I don't want to disturb him, he's sleeping, right? You wake them up and they're like, come on man, I was trying to sleep. You're like, bro, that house is going to burn down. You're going to die. And if nothing else, I'm going to pick you up by force and take you out and save your life. Wallahi, the fire of Jahannam is worse. It's worse. So we, with hikmah, with wisdom, with love, show them the importance of what they're being told and don't let it be something people can laugh off. Is TikTok haram and women's? And women's? Um, so you, TikTok, I don't have TikTok, alhamdulillah. Uh, from what I understand, TikTok has a lot of music videos, a lot of uh, uh, not good videos, and even if you don't search for them, they kind of come up and things from what I've been told and things. So, in that case, it would not be permissible. If somebody can use TikTok in a way that they don't indulge in looking at that which is haram and don't deal with music and only use it for da'wah, then khalaf, then it would be fine. If you cannot, then don't have TikTok. So. And that is true for any platform. Oh, sorry, I forgot the question. Um, I know this is like kind of a bit of a vague question. It's kind of like a question that that's why I use it too long. What are like, how would you give Dawah in the workplace? The what? How would you, like, like, how would you give Dawah in the workplace? Dawah in the workplace is very easy. Uh, you don't give Dawah in the workplace by going to somebody and saying, hey, become Muslim. That's not the way it works, right? But you can trigger people's curiosity. I work with a lot of scientists, I work with a lot of PhDs, biologists, and so on. So when we have discussions about work things, Things like the adaptation of creatures and evolution and things come up. So we start a conversation. If you feel that it's not appropriate for a workplace, you can tell them, hey, you know what, I don't, if you want, we'll meet up after work, go somewhere, sit down, have some coffee and talk about it, right? Of course, not if it's men and women and matter and things. We don't want people going out on dates calling it down. But, uh, but yani, if you have, like if you're a woman and you work with another woman and you have that uh, situation, tell her, hey, you know what? Let's go out, you can go sit at my house, have some tea, you know, I can do henna for you, and we can talk about it, you know, or something like this. Find something to bond with and, and talk about. If you're a guy, and you, this guy works with you, and tell him, hey, you know what, we got a program at the mosque, why don't you come by, we'll have some food, we can sit and talk. People talk politics at work. People say, well, you shouldn't, but they do. People talk uh, any sports and get upset and angry with each other because the Falcons beat the... Giants or something, whatever, right? Um, why are we shy to discuss religion? Again, in a way with hikmah, in a way that's legal, in a way that has wisdom, you can bring up these subjects. Christmas is coming up, and if you're not going to go to the company Christmas party, you can kind of tell them, hey, you know what, I don't do that thing, I'm Muslim. It's kind of funny because, you know, I studied the Bible a little bit, and I didn't find anything about that. You know, they might be like, oh yeah, it's got nothing with the Bible. Where did it come from? Right? Open up that door. Right? Maybe somebody's you know going through a hard time in life and tell them, hey, you know what? I got a prayer that I usually say. You mind if you want? I can share it with you. You know, ask Allah for guidance and you know who Allah is and you know take it out when you go out for lunch or a break or something like this in a way of wisdom. If nothing else, in the way that you carry yourself will be a God. So it will stop for salah. We'll get you that. Sorry, go for it. So. Should someone be worried about encouraging someone to teach a when you know that you don't have any way to support them? That's a hard question, especially for my last question for tonight. Man. I gotta hit you with something hard. Should you push for the shahada knowing that there is nobody that will support that person? Let's say you're going, you're changing flights in Nebraska, um, maybe there's Muslims, let's say uh, Alaska, I'm sure there's Muslims there too. Um, and somebody comes up to you and they don't know any of the local Muslims and you, it's, it's a judgment call but I would say yes why? because if they say the statement of Tawheed and you have fulfilled your responsibility and as long as they stay on that even if they don't learn much more at least it will take them out of jail right? 
If somebody's not ready like somebody like, oh, I still believe Jesus is the Son of God or something, don't push for Shahada because they're not ready. But if somebody's ready, give them the Shahada. And don't think that this is from you. Allah brought them to you, and if Allah gave them that high guidance, Allah will find a way for them to find something. So, we'll end with that. Inshallah, we'll have dinner. We can continue with some more questions with dinner after Salah. Thank you.